The Amazon is the world's largest tropical forest, harboring millions of species. Deforestation there has dropped significantly over the last five years. More law enforcement alongside the global recession has probably been the cause. But forest loss in the Amazon is still a problem. Researchers keep tabs on deforestation by satellite, but to know the reality of what's causing it, you have to be there in person. That was the motivation behind researcher Robert Walker's recent Amazon adventure. Our, our objective was to interview loggers and people knowledgeable about the logging sector in order to, to understand how it is that they actually open the rainforest through their road building activities. So Walker, along with colleagues Eugenio Arima and Rital Maria Pereira, set out on a road trip. They started at Sao Felix do Xingu, then flew to Santa Reim, and drove west along the Trans-Amazon Highway, which isn't like any highway most of us would picture. The road itself was, was absolutely wild. Uh, we were lucky. We bought sleeping bags. We really didn't know what to expect. Uh, we didn't know how, what the road would be like, uh, whether it would be passable. And in fact, the last leg was nearly impassable from Umaytá to Labria. It was so wet, it was 200 kilometers. We didn't see a single vehicle on the road, except the road maintenance crews. And that, no one's on the road. It's empty and there are a lot of Jaguars there. So if you get stuck in the road, you have to sleep with all your windows up or a cat is going to cause you problems. They drove 900 miles west in a rented jeep from Santa Rem to La Brea, a trip which took them nine days. The whole trip along the side of the road, it was just forced after a mile upon mile upon mile of force. On the western Trans-Amazon, it is literally a quarter of green forest, the entire road. Though they didn't get to interview any loggers, they talked with people all along the way. They came upon an active gold mine and were allowed access something very rarely given to outsiders. And quite frankly, they're not, ple they're not pleasant places, nor are they very safe. They spoke with a group of Kayapo Indians, learning firsthand about the deals they'd made with loggers in the past. A lot of the logging that had occurred in the region had occurred on their historic territories. And in a close-up wildlife encounter, they stumbled upon what Walker calls a macaw city. It was just one of those magical nature moments uh, that I, I hadn't had since I was maybe 10 years old. In the end, they found what is probably the logging frontier in Brazil, where logging, both legal and illegal, is now concentrated. On the way to the, the vila, we, you have to cross a river, it's the Aipuana. We observe logging trucks coming from Vila Santo Antonio do Mantuqui, which is just to the west, and they were big trucks, Mercedes-Benz trucks. Uh, they call them Romeo Juliet trucks. They have two cabins, or two beds, I should say, and they were stacked with sawn wood, and they were coming one after the other. With this knowledge, on their next trip, the team hopes to focus their investigation on logging in the villa, if possible. But Walker and company also learned that it's not just logging that threatens these ecosystems. The pattern of roads they'd seen from satellite imagery had led them to believe it was logging that was fragmenting the forest and sprawling into virgin land. You get these very disorganized, we call it dendritic fragmentation. They're basically spidery networks of lines on the satellite images. It turns out this kind of development was also being produced by settlers, ranchers, even local governments. These groups haven't gotten much attention in past conservation efforts but they could better protect the forest if they built roads and farms in a more orderly pattern. And so one of the keys to sustainable development is to finding the pattern that minimizes these impacts, the pattern of opening the native forest in such a way that you have minimal impact on the plants and animals that reside there. One of the patterns we believe is potentially sustainable in this regard is fishbone they call it fishbone fragmentation, and that's, I, I don't know if there's a, just a, an, another term for it. It's, it's, you'll see it on satellite images, and, and it looks like a fishbone. It looks like a comb. Development can coexist with conservation. The moral of the story is it just needs to be done thoughtfully.
For the National Science Foundation, I'm Lisa Raffensperger.